is here today. He is on the move. Team did a great job. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. Valerie, Valerie and Brian are on their family vacation this week, and but we're thankful for our team leading us into the presence of God. Here this morning, here in a few moments, we're going to receive our tithe and our offering. Thank you guys so much for your generosity, and we're able to reach our city. Uh, we want to do more than just keep the lights on. You know, how many know that summer can be a challenge for uh, churches to keep, even keep the lights on? And we want to go beyond that. We want to take the light out into the world. But that happens when we are generous and we give to God. Just for example, even like our electric bill, what was it, $1,000? Carol, our water bill, $1,000? You don't even think about those things. But when we give, we're able to do more than just survive. How many know this church ought to do more than survive? That we ought to thrive and we want to reach our community and it's through generosity that, that we're able to do that. Thank you so much. I shared about uh, we had a generous donor uh, do our prayer garden last week. Now we've got new mulch out here. The guys unload with a couple hundred dollars of mulch. And if you want to donate, some people have asked about the mulch. You can donate towards that to help us out and reimburse for that. It was a couple hundred bucks. And But we're excited. We're just one that we're making room for more expecting company. We believe this is God's house and we ought to treat it um, like we should. Amen. And so before we receive our tithe and our offering, you can text the word GIVE to 84321. I know many of you do that. You get paid on Friday. You're able to do that. You're here this morning uh, or you get your direct deposit. You're able to do that. And thank you for your generosity. And uh, so uh, beyond just our tithe, we have our mortgage. Last year, we started about $308,000 on our mortgage payoff. And today, I want to report that we are down to $279,868. Isn't that awesome? We believe that God is going to bless us, that we can pay off this building, that one day we're going to build a gymnasium for our students, for our food pantry, for our kids, that we could reach even more people for Jesus. God has called us to be a lighthouse in this community. This church has been here for over 50-some years, and we are excited to be a part of what God is doing in this city. And when we give, we can accelerate what we can do. You know, we can say, well, that sounds good. One day we can have a gym. One day we can pay this off. One day that we can upgrade. You know, we're raising funds to upgrade our drums. But when we give, we can accelerate what we're able to do. It's not something, well, we'll, we'll do that one day when we get around to it. But when we are generous and we all give, uh, there, there's great things that God can do. A couple of real quick announcements before we receive our tithe and offering. We do have... Uh, our lunch bunch going out next week. Robin and Phil will be in the foyer. Sign up for that, and they need your information. They have a list of restaurants, and they already have the next week's already picked out. I'll let them share that out there. On July 14th, we are starting a new Good Shepherd growth track. As many of you have been through this, if you're new to the church, a great opportunity for you to hear our vision, our responsibilities as a church, what we feel our burden is. And so that's going to be starting on July the 14th. And some of you need to take that next step. And also, speaking of next steps, we're going to be baptizing on July the 7th. So if you've been saved and you want to be baptized and take that next step and go public with your faith, this is a great opportunity on the 7th. Carolyn has Bible study on Wednesday. Valerie and Brian's Bible study is going to start on July 10th in their home. And we have our couples night July the 19th. You can put that on your calendar. We want you to be a part of that. We had a great time. Carol uh, does crochet group. We have some great groups and we want to start more. We want to connect and we need connection. How many know we need the community? And when we are a part of the family of God, that we don't do life alone, but we're here for one another. We encourage, we pray, we support each other, and that's what it's about, being a part of the family of God. This building is not the church. We are the church. You are the church, and we come together, especially on a Sunday morning. It's a, an opportunity for us to connect and worship our God. Amen? Praise the Lord. He is so good. Our ushers are getting ready to come. Again, there's offering envelopes there on the table. And we're going to receive our offer. You make a check out to Good Shepherd. Again, you can do the text to give, 84321. I think she's got that on the screen back there. But thank you so much. Again, we want to do more than just keep the lights on. We want to be a light in our community and make a difference. And that's what God's called us to do. Our food pantry fed 8,200 people, I think, last year. 
and it's just growing every month, and God is truly blessed. And if our ushers will come, we're going to see our offering, and then we're going to jump right into the Word of God. Father, we thank you that you're the source, God. And your word says that you would build your church, God. And we thank, we're thank we thankful that we get to be a part of your church and build with you. And I ask, God, that you would bless these givers, bless our families, God. Meet every need, Lord, right now. For those that are unemployed, give them a job. Those that are underemployed, give them better jobs, God. And we thank you that every blessing comes from you. Your word says that you open your hands and we receive. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Oh, my goodness. Has the Lord been good to you? Do you have breath in your lungs? Has he saved you? Can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Amen. He is worthy to be praised. As long as we have breath in our lungs, we need to be worshiping God. We need to be praising him because he is so good. Amen. Jason, would you mind coming down with your guitar? Would that be our? Can you come down here with your guitar? Unplug. You can be unplugged. Can we do that? Is that okay? <laughs> okay, listen. I asked Jason to be part of my sermon this morning, and I'm so excited to be able to speak. It's an honor to be able to speak today. We're talking about finding hope when your world seems hopeless. And uh, so I'm excited about the part that Pastor's given me to speak on. And so, you know, we all enjoy wonderful music. We enjoy the harmony of it and how beautiful it is. Like today was wonderful. We enjoyed that worship. And so, Jason, I want you. Oh, my gosh. That was not part of the deal. I was not to sing solo. Okay, listen. So, Jason, I want you to play us some something on your guitar while it's tuned up and ready to go. That's wonderful. Now, doesn't that sound beautiful? Can we just give him a clap there? That sounded great, right? Now, Jason, what would you what would you think if you could maybe change a couple of strings out of tune? Would you play for us? <laughs> All right, then. And so that's a little different, right? You can definitely tell that does not sound as good as the first, not to hurt your feelings or anything. But that did not sound as good as the first one, right? So what if you go ahead and fix those? Oh, and you know what? I want to take a second. He didn't, um, you know, he didn't get the two, just all the strings out of tune. Just two of them was out of tune. But it totally threw the sound off, didn't it? So if you tuned it back up, can you play something for us? And now those two strings are all tuned back with the other ones. That sounds much better, doesn't it, right? Thank you, Jason, very much. Woohoo! I'm glad I didn't have to sing. I wanted him to do that because, you know, when all of the strings are tuned together, it sounded beautiful. It had a beautiful sound. And then only two strings were out of tune, just a tiny little adjustment. It didn't take him long, did it? He adjusted just a little bit, two strings, and then the sound was terrible. It did not sound very good at all. But then when he adjusted those two strings back in tune with the other strings, it sounded great. Today, we're going to be talking about how if we, are, if our lives are in tune with God, we can be in tune with others. Amen? And, you know, it takes all of us working together to win people for the Lord. And God has called us to be in tune with him so that we can be in tune with others. God wants us to live a life of harmony, that it is pleasing to others, that we set a great example to others. You know, our lives are what's going to be a witness to others. And it only took two strings to be out of tune for it to throw everything off. 
And I want to just think about that for a second. It could just take a couple of things in our lives that could be out of tune that will throw our life completely off course, and we will not be in tune with God. You know, it's funny whenever I drive and then pastor drives. In my, in my Kia, I love it so much because I can raise the seat up. Now, I don't know if anybody else likes that or not, but when I get in the car, if pastor's been driving, I can barely take my foot to that brake pedal to start the car. And when we get in the car, I want to go ahead and adjust my seat. And he says, well, I'm burning up. You need to just start the car. And I'm over here just stretching as far as I can to start that car. Now, when I drive that car, I do a couple of adjustments. I raise, she's saying yes, I raise that seat up high. I bring it as close as it can be so I can see over the hood of the car. And then pastor tries to get in that car, and he cannot get in the car. His head is going to hit the roof, and he cannot fit in the car. And he's like, this is too high. Let me lower the seat before I ever get in the car. He has to make some adjustments. In our lives, as we are serving the Lord, there are going to be times that we have to make some adjustments so that we can stay in tune with God. Because God has created us to have relationships with each other, friendships, relationships. He's never meant for us to live our life alone, doing life alone. Now, I understand that there are some personalities, some are introverted, some are extroverted. We all know I am extroverted, but there are times I could probably be introverted. After I've worked all week, I'd like to just be home and not go anywhere. And some of you are like, yes, I agree with that. But you know what? That's what the enemy would love. He would love if we would isolate ourselves, not be amongst believers to encourage one another. And so it's important about relationships. So important that Peter wrote about it in 1 Peter chapter 2. He wrote about the different types, three different types of relationship and how that if we're in tune with God, we can be in tune with others. You know, sometimes on Facebook, people will put on there about their relationship that it's complicated. Well, relationships can be complicated, but it doesn't mean that they have to be complicated. And if we make the Lord Lord of our life over everything, then we can find what it is to be in harmony with each other. How to be able to get along with that coworker that may be hard to get along with. How to get along with that family member that always just wants to argue about something. How to get along with your spouse or, or whatever it is. We can learn what the Bible says about that because God wants us all to be in tune with him and then we can be in tune with each other. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 13 here in just a moment, but I want to pray. Lord, I just love you, and I thank you for today. I thank you that we can come together and have that wonderful time of worship and to be able to come and just bask in your presence. But also, thank you for the time of the word that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, and that, Lord, it comes and it speaks to us and it does a work in us so that we can be closer to you, so that we can reach others. And I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us in Jesus' name. In Romans 15, verses 5 through 6 in the New Living Translation, it says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus, then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are commanded in the Bible to live in harmony with one another, not to live in conflict, not to live in strife, not to be um, at odds against each other, not to be talking about each other, but learning to live together in one accord. God has not intended us for us to do life alone, but to be together. He wants us to have healthy relationships with each other. You know, as I think about this scriptures here in 1 Peter 2, in verse 13, it's going to start. It says, For the Lord's sake, respect all human authority, whether the king 
as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do what is right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters and fear God and respect the king. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he's going to go through, and chapter 3, he's going to go through three different relationships. The first is having respect for our government. Now some of you might be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> The second is having respect for our workplace and our, our bosses. And the third is husbands and wives. And this is an arrangement. The Greek word for submit is hupatasso, which is a funny word to say, hupatasso. Hupatasso means it is arranged in orderly fashion. He has given us a recipe of how to orderly arrange in orderly fashion relationships that we can silence those who do not, that are foolish and that want to speak against us because our life as Christians should be a witness. It's not always what we have to say to others about the Lord, but it's how we live our lives, how we handle others. Listen, when you go to work and someone's being crazy, people are going to watch how you react at that. When the when things are going crazy in the world, people are going to look and see, how are you going to react to that? How are you going to react on Facebook with that? Listen, uh, this is what is what people look at. When people want to see how you're doing something, they're going to look and see, how do you handle those situations? And so we have to know what the Word of God says. Now here in 1 Peter, it talks about respecting our government authority. Now, do you know that we are called to obey the law? Like we are not supposed to break the law. I remember one time when Pastor had had open heart surgery, and we were driving in the car. And I have only, I was driving, and whenever I was driving, I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a policeman behind my car. And I thought, well, I have nothing to be afraid of. I have nothing to be scared of. I don't speed. I've never been pulled over in my life. It's fine that he's back there. I even wanted to just wave and say, hello, I'm a law-abiding citizen. You don't have to pull me over. And so then uh, I was just driving, and all of a sudden I looked in the rearview mirrors, and I see these lights flashing, and I hear this siren. I was like, is he pulling me over? And I, I, Josh was like, honey, I think he's pulling you over. You need to pull over. I was like, are you serious? And I, do you know what? At, at before that, I was fine. I was happy he was behind me. But then all of a sudden, I was scared. And my heart was beating fast out of my chest. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what have I done? I was stopped at the red light. I don't believe I'd broke any laws. And I pulled over, and I parked. And I, my hands were shaking, and I was rolling the window down. And, you know, Pastor, he couldn't drive because he just had open heart surgery. He was being chauffeured. And I rolled that window down. I said, hello, officer. He said, do you know your tags are expired? And I just sat there. I said, what? He said, your tags are expired. And then I remember I had a flash of, of, of the little card you get and it was hanging on my refrigerator and during the whole thing of pastor and his surgery I totally forgot to pay my car tags I was driving with expired tags and I and he said can you please get your uh, license and registration out and I mean I was fumbling all over the place I had um, I had a gun in the glove box for protection <laughs> And I thought, oh, my Lord, this is going real bad, real quick. And my hands were shaking. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to open this glove box and this gun's here. And I mean, which there was nothing wrong for me to have a gun, but the gun's in the glove box. I'm driving with expired tags. Here just five minutes ago, I was a sweet, law-abiding citizen, and I am breaking a rule. And I, I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm like over there trying to look at Josh like, there's a gun in the club box. Do something. And like, you know, just turn to give him a hint. Like, I don't know what to do. And so anyway, uh, 
I said, I, I, I said, I'm so sorry. So then I just tried to turn on my southern accent. And I said, I'm so sorry. Uh, I said, listen, I said, I didn't know that they were expired. My husband just had open heart surgery. Things have been so crazy. I was rambling all over the place. And my husband said, please excuse her. She's scared. She don't know what she's doing. And then when I thank God, when I said that he had open heart surgery, he was like, my mom had open heart surgery and praise the Lord. They started talking and it changed it where I could sneak out the registration and and I can't even see the gun. And I go in there and I'm shaking and I hand it to him. He said, Mrs. Sergeant, he said, you know what? It's going to be okay. He said, just Monday, go get your tags renewed. I'll just let you go on. I was like, oh, thank you so much. But in that moment, I was so afraid that, oh, my gosh, I've broke the rules. I've broke the law. But you know what? As Christians, and then I had a gun in the club box. And then, but as Christians, we are to be law-abiding citizens. Like, we are to respect our authority. We are uh, seeing people growing up in this generation that does not know how to respect authority. And as believers, we are to be law-abiding citizens. Now, does that mean if the government asks us to do something that goes against God and his word, then we do not do that. I mean, you think about back when the babies were being born and Pharaoh asked the midwives to kill the firstborn sons. They were God-fearing, and they said, no, we will not do that. You think about Daniel, whenever King Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, I want you to bow down and worship me. Daniel knew, I'm not going to worship you, I worship God. And Daniel then said, no, I'm worshiping God. So you have that, right? But when it comes to respecting our government authority, I believe it can come with our words. I believe it can come with our attitude toward what's going on in our government. We may not agree with what's going on in the, in the uh, person, with the person that's in the office right now. We may not agree with that. That may not be what we think should be going on, and it may not be right with the Lord. However, we are, say, we are told here to respect, but also it tells us in his word, and this is something Pastor and I we really focus on with this scripture it says that with our leaders that we are to pray for them first timothy 2 1 through 4 in the passion translation says most of all i'm writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to god pray for all men with all forms of prayers and requests that you intercede with intense passion and pray for every political leader. Now, it doesn't say pray for the ones that you agree with or the ones that's serving God. Because let me tell you what, if there's a political leader that's not serving God, they need prayer. If there's one that is serving God, they need prayer. This is what the Bible says. And it says to pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. It is pleasing to our Savior God to pray for them. He longs for everyone to embrace his life and return to the full knowledge of the truth. As believers... We are called to pray for our leaders. We are called to pray for our police officers. We are called to pray for our mayor, for our governor, for the Supreme Court justices. We are called to pray for all of those. Yes, it would be easy to complain and to go on about what we don't agree with, or we can put work toward it and we can pray for them. Because I'll tell you what, the words of nagging about it, the words of complaining about it, it, the words of just putting people down does not do anything but prayer changes it and I'll tell you what when you can learn to set aside your differences and to just pray for the person to trust the Lord with it it's going to change your attitude it's going to change the way you look at things it says that if you do this we're going to live a tranquil life a life of peace now we all know that November's coming 
And in the next couple of months, you might see some people act crazy. And they may go on Facebook and they may want to argue. They may want to put things on there. But I want to challenge you that whatever you say, whatever you post, let it point others to Jesus. Don't get trapped in strife, in arguing with others, in wanting to make quick remarks. Don't get trapped with wanting to put others down. You can either build people up or you can tear them down with your words. And sure, it may feel good for a moment to hop on there and type out what you think <laughs> and what you feel, but what does that do for your witness? We are living in the last days, and it's not time to play around. It's time that we win people for the Lord. But I will tell you, a quick way to ruin your witness is to take the bait of the enemy, to walk in offense, to walk in strife, to walk in gossip. Talking about a person that you don't agree with, that's gossip. That's not being a Christian. And now more than ever, we need to stand up for what is right, but that means walking in love. That means praying for people, praying for those that we may not agree with and those that we agree with. It didn't say that we are to pray for specific people, but we are to pray for every person. And here, Peter is telling us how we can be in tune with God, we can be in tune with others. The only way to be in tune with God is to make him Lord of all, Lord of your life. That you are saying, Lord, I want my life to be pleasing to you as a sacrifice, a sweet aroma to you, Lord. Let my life be pleasing. What are some things that keep us from being in tune? Well, strife keeps us from being being in tune. Offense keeps us from being in tune. Gossiping keeps us from being in tune. Listen, if somebody comes to me and wants to gossip, I just walk away. Because if they're going to talk about somebody to you, you can guarantee they talk about you when you're not around. Don't be the one to agree with them. Don't be the one to say anything. Just say, you know what, I've got, I've got to go. If you have to say, i got to go to the bathroom, I'm sure you can go make yourself go to the bathroom. <laughs> just say, i got to go. i got to go to the bathroom. And just do not be involved in that because you can ruin your witness. But he says, Hupatasso, submit. Sometimes people have a really bad um, taste in their mouth about the word submit. But what it is is giving honor to the authority that's in your life. Just as I give honor to my husband because, number one, he's my husband. But then I also give honor to him because he's my pastor. And I know that he jokes around about it and says, you know, Beth has to open my communion for me. Because <laughs> you know they're hard to open up. But here's the thing. I don't have to open that communion up for him. Every time that I get to have serve communion with him, the way I look at it is I'm serving communion to my, my pastor. I have the honor to serve my pastor. That's why I open your communion. You could open it yourself. But I honor you as the position of you as my pastor, you as my husband. Now, let me tell you what. We're going to get to the husbands and wives thing. It's not always been easy. It still isn't easy now. I'll just be honest. I'll just be honest with it, okay? There's times he'll say, no, Beth, you need to do this. And everything in me don't want to do that. I'll just be like, oh, my gosh. I have to, but I have to submit. I have to be willing to do what he says to do because he has my best interest in mind. And you know what? As a pastor, we can... You can come to us for advice, and we can tell you what we feel like would be the best thing for you to do, but we can't make you do those things. You have to make those choices on your own. But we have to respect the authority that's placed in our lives. Just as we have, we have someone that, that is um, the person that we are under as, our, our leadership. And, we, and, it, and you know what? We may not agree sometimes. There was times back when I was a teenager, my pastor might do something, and I didn't understand why in the world he did it. I might have thought it was the silliest thing I ever heard of. But I never once told him I thought that because I knew he had a reason for it because I respected the authority. 
I respected that. And we have to respect that in our government. But then it also goes on to talk about respecting your boss in the workplace. In 1 Peter 2, 18 through 23, it talks about the workplace. Now, this is something that I remind myself of every single day. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Listen, when we go to work, you may have a great boss. You may have someone that's not a great boss. But if you go in with the attitude that as I work, I'm doing it as and to the Lord, then we know we're going to stay in the right attitude. Not everyone may have the ideal boss or think that it's the right <clears throat> situation to be in, but we have to go that we are respecting, but we're also having a good work ethic. That means we have to be people of integrity. We have to be people that even though it may not be ideal, it talks about that in 1 Peter 2, that it may not be the most ideal thing, but in Isaiah, it says that he went through all the suffering and still kept his mouth shut. That you may not have the ideal environment to work in, but will you keep your mouth shut when you need to keep your mouth shut will you have the right attitude will you stay in tune with God so that you can still be in tune with difficult people that you can still be in tune with who you're working for but he goes on to say that we are to have respect submit to the authority because that's how God had put it in order for us so you may be in the workplace and it may not be the ideal place but you know what? God's going to give you the grace that you need to be able to go through that. He's going to be able to help you with that and be able to do that. And the third is showing respect in your home. Now, chapter 3. I don't know what Peter was thinking, but oh, this is crazy. He wrote six verses for the women and one verse for the man. Now, ladies, I don't know what uh, Peter was thinking. I, I don't know if he had a difficult wife. I don't know what his deal was. But he wrote six verses for us and only one verse for the husband. And I got to thinking about that. And I was like, no, Lord, that just doesn't even seem fair. But however, we're going to read these verses. And whenever you do read the one verse for the man, there is a lot packed in there. So praise God for that. Now, the men do not get off easy. Just like we have six verses. But we're going to read this. It says, In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. And then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit. I know, ladies. Whew. Which is, listen, that's hard. But this is what the Bible says. Which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now there are some relationships that are not healthy where a husband would take this and just be very mean and abusive. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about that you have respect for your husband in the position that God has placed him in your lives. God has placed him to be the head of the house. This is what God has designed for us. And just as we are to submit to our husbands, husbands, we need some godly men to be the husband of this family. Amen? 
we now more than ever, we need men to rise up in the authority that God has given them and to be the godly man of the house, to be the one that sets the example for their wife, to be the one that says, let's pray together, let's read our, the Bible together, to be the one that leads the family that says, we're coming to church on Sunday. It's not an option. It's not a question whether we're going to come to church. A husband that's going to rise up and say, hey, Sunday's coming. We're all going to church. We're all serving the Lord together. Hey, we're going to give our tithe and offering to the Lord because this is what God has asked us to do. We need men to step up and to be that for the wives. However, wives, we have a job as well. And it says for us to be, have a gentle and quiet spirit. It also talks about at the beginning of what to do if a wife is married to an unbeliever. And I love how he says that as if you're married to an unbeliever, it's not you being over him, beating him in the head with the Bible and saying, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. It says that he will be won over by the way that you live your life. A great example of this is when we were younger, Sister Mary Atkins, she was the sweetest little lady that went to our church. She actually taught me how to pray on Tuesday nights. And she was so humble and quiet and sweet as could be. And she would come to church every Sunday. Her husband would pull under the awning and drop her off. He never came in. He never came to church. But she never stopped. She kept on. She came to prayer on Tuesdays. She came to church every Sunday. She came to church every Wednesday. And she kept living that consistent life. She was known as a prayer woman. She would even give out prayer hankies. Remember handkerchiefs? I have a handkerchief that was my mom's that she gave my mom. And she wrote a scripture on there and had prayed over that for my mom's healing. And I have that, I have that handkerchief that Sister Mary gave to my mom. Sister Mary never gave up. She never quit. I'm sure she did become um, disheartened because her husband would not come to church. But years and years went by. And then finally, one day, Sister Mary walked in the church, but she didn't walk in alone. She walked in with her husband, Norman, and Norman gave his life to the Lord. Sister Mary lived a life in front of him, and he gave his life to God. Now, that does not mean that you're supposed to, if you're single, that you are supposed to come marry an unbeliever. We are supposed to be equally yoked. And so you're just asking for trouble if you marry an unbeliever, knowing he's an unbeliever. But there could be times that maybe you weren't serving God, and then the two of you got married, and then you came to know Jesus, right? So that can happen. But it's not for us to go seek out a person that's not serving the Lord, thinking we're going to have a mission, you know. We're not a missionary for that. We want to align ourselves with people that are serving God but if you're in a situation where he's not a believer it's your life it's your life but then listen it goes on beyond that anybody that you're around that's an unbeliever it's your life that's going to win them for the Lord then it goes on and it says that us wives we are to have a gentle and quiet spirit I'll tell you I I could not imagine being a husband Listen, I've done a lot of thinking about this. I've done a lot of thinking about this. And I don't know, I, I just think he has a big job, a hard job. Well, first of all, because he met me when I was 15 years old. I was just a young little thing, skinny as a rail. And then he goes through the different stages of life with me. And then he, does, uh, he has to go through me having children, which brings on hormones, which are crazy. Then gaining weight, then losing weight, then back into a stage of transitioning into a whole other stage of being a woman in your 40s and 50s. And all the kinds of things and hormones that go along with that. And the weight gain as well and I think this poor man he's gone through so much <laughs> but then I have to bring it back to myself 
and it says to be a gentle and quiet spirit. That has not always been easy for me. There have been times that, you know, he might do something that just might get on my nerves. I'll tell him that. I have to have a gentle and quiet spirit. And I have to learn to be obedient to my husband in that, right? But it says to have a gentle and quiet spirit. What does that mean? That means that we are to respect our husbands. We're not to bash our husbands on social media or to our friends or to talk down to our husbands or to talk about our husbands to others or to portray that we want to make fun of our husbands. Our husbands love us and support us, but we are to have a gentle and quiet spirit about us. So many times people are focused on the outward appearance. Like if we're all honest, if we took a group picture, as soon as that picture is done, what do we do when we look at that picture? We zoom in on ourselves to see what we look like in that picture. We don't care what anybody else looks like in that picture, but we care about what we look like in that picture. And we are so focused on our outward, but we are to be focused on the inward. What's going on on the inside? But we are to watch our attitude. We are to have a gentle and quiet spirit. And then it goes on to say to the husbands, now that we've went through six verses for the wife, we're going to see what it says to the husbands. One verse. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. This is where you ladies say amen. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. So, in the same way husbands give honor to your wives, that means you want to respect your wives, right? You want to give honor to them. And then it says, treat them with understanding as you live together. Sometimes it could be easy for a husband to think, well, I work all these hours to provide for my, my spouse, to provide for my children, so I've done what I'm supposed to do. Well, yes, you've done what God would want you to do to provide for your home, that's for sure. However, it says to live with your wife, to know them. It says to live with them, because she, and she may be weaker than you, but she is your equal partner. Weaker meaning that, you know what? It's just the fact. Men are stronger than women. I mean, it's the way that God made us. It doesn't mean that we're weaklings and that we should be looked down upon. It's just the way that God created men and women. However, you are to respect your wife. You are to have honor for your wife. You are to revere your wife. You, she is a gift to you. You are equal partners in that new life together. But it goes on to talk about knowledge. You are to know her. This is the part that I, I was reading commentaries on, and I was like, oh, he's got a hard job. Not just to know what my favorite food is or my favorite color is or what my favorite music is, not my favorite flower. That's not it. It means to know what my feelings are, to know what my thoughts are, to know what I'm upset about, why I'm upset to try to stop and understand me, to take the time to listen to me, to take the time to listen to your wife, to know what, what her thoughts are, to know her. We all go through different things, but we are to honor our wives and to respect them because it talks about how we, we are the weaker in there than they are. You think about a guy's getting together, throwing a football. They're going to be rough and rugged with that football. But then you think about the wife. When it says to honor and to respect, you think about a nice, pretty, pink, flowery, fragile china cup. You're not going to throw that cup. You're going to handle it delicately. Right? You're going to know that this is precious. This is priceless. Husbands, your wives are priceless. They're, they're precious. And we are to handle them that way. So how can we stay in tune with one another? The ways that we can stay in tune with one another 
are to be humble. We have to be humble. Listen, if I'm going to have respect for those that are placed in authority, I have to be humble. There was one time that uh, someone that I had prayed and prayed forever to forgive. Because sometimes when someone does something to you, sometimes it's quick to forgive. Other times you have to pray forever before you feel like you've forgiven them. And you have to keep praying every single day like, Lord, I'm asking you, please let me forgive them. And so someone had done something that was just very harmful and hurtful with their words toward me. And I was like, Lord, please help me to forgive them. And one day I found out they were dying of cancer. And I was doing the dishes, and I was praying. I was like, well, Lord, please heal them. And you know what? It's so funny because I, I'll pray that and think, well, look at this. Isn't this great of me? I've forgiven them that I can pray that the Lord would heal their body. And I just know the Lord's laughing. He says, why don't you cook them a meal and go visit them? And I said, well, Lord, you know I've forgiven them. I'm asking you to heal them. He said, cook them a meal. And when you cook a meal for them, Pray the whole time you're cooking it. Then go visit with them. I did not want to do that. That was the last thing I wanted to do. But I humbled myself, and I cooked a meal for them. And while I was cooking that meatloaf, I was praying every time I put ingredients, I was praying for them. I was praying in the spirit, praying over them. I called them up, and I said, hey, I'd like to bring this dinner over to you. Would that be okay? They were sure. And I took Sophie with me. And so we went, and I delivered the meal, and the Lord sat down and visit. That's what he said. Sit down and visit for a little while. I didn't want to do that. But I know that I want to make him Lord of all my life, right? And that was the way I was going to do it. I said, okay. So I sat down, and I visited. And it was a wonderful visit. So wonderful that when I was walking out the door, I caught myself. I'll see you next Tuesday, and I'll bring you another meal. And I continued that for several weeks. But what would have happened if I would not have humbled myself enough to do that? I would not have been in tune with God. That's for sure. And I definitely wouldn't have been in tune with that person. But I had to learn to humble myself. If we're going to be in tune with God and others, we have to humble ourselves sometimes. That means doing things that we don't want to do, that it doesn't feel good to do. But we know if we're being obedient, then we can do it, right? So it's to humble ourselves. It's to be, but it's to be mature. It's to know that it takes integrity not to gossip. It takes integrity not to listen to gossip. It takes integrity to stay in unity. And also... You have to make unity a priority. It says in Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Listen, unity doesn't just happen. You have to work toward unity. You have to strive. You have to strain every nerve to have unity. You have to be on purpose for unity. But this is what we do to become in tune with one another. We have to have the right attitude. We have to know not to sow discord. We have to choose unity as a priority. And the last, and I'm going to close with this one if our team is ready. The last one is, is we can't be spiteful. We cannot be spiteful. If we are going to be in tune with God, if we are going to be in tune with one another, we cannot be spiteful. In Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 in the Message Bible, it says, A good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve. Ladies, can your husband say that? Can they say that they trust you without reserve? They trust her without reserve and never have reason to regret it. Never spiteful. She treats him generously all her life long. One time I was doing research on this scripture. And I loved how it said she was never spiteful. And I thought, well... What exactly does spiteful mean? And spiteful actually means 
not wanting to cause harm to someone. It says, spiteful is a malicious, usually petty. Have any of us ever been petty before? <laughs> I have been petty. I'll just be the first to tell you I've been petty about things. Never, usually petty, desire to harm, annoy, frustrate, or to humiliate another person. Bitter, ill will, and malice. But another definition for spiteful is venomous. Our words and our actions can be venomous. They can be poisonous to someone. A king cobra snake is a snake that carries so much powerful venom that if you were ever bit by this snake, you will be dead in less than 10 minutes. If a king cobra was to ever get to you and bite you, that venom will hit your body and it will attack your nervous system quickly like that. And you will become paralyzed within minutes. You cannot move your body. You become paralyzed and then it will go straight to your heart and you will have a massive heart attack. When we are spiteful, it can be so poisonous. It could paralyze a person. It could do so much damage to their heart. There are power in our words, in our actions, in our attitudes. And I want you to search your heart today is there anyone that you're being spiteful with that that venom is going to get to them and it cause that much harm? It's so venomous to the heart. But today, if we are going to submit to the Lord and make Him Lord of all of our life, if we want to be in tune with Him, so that we can be in tune with others. There's one thing we have to do. We have to search our heart. We have to search our heart. Psalms 139, 23 through 24 in the Passion Translation says, God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. See if there is any path of pain I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious everlasting ways, the path that brings me back to you. Let's stand to our feet today. Today I want you to ask the Lord to search your heart. I know this isn't an easy thing to do. Sometimes when we get ready to ask the Lord to search our heart, we're afraid of what he's going to find. <laughs> We're like, oh, what's he going to find in there? Sometimes things can be left undetected. You don't know that it's there. One of the reasons I think that is because we're so busy. We never stop, spend time in the presence of the Lord. You know, when you spend time in the presence of the Lord, he, does, he gets to do a work in your heart. But when you're so busy and you're constantly on the go and you don't spend time with the Lord, you don't get him speaking to you. He's not able to get to your heart. Listen, he wants to speak to us today so that we can be in tune with him and in that with others. But it says, and I invite you to search and for your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Can you say that to the Lord today? Say, Lord, I invite your gazing search into my heart. I want you to search me and examine me through and through. And I want you to find out everything that may be hidden within me. Can you pray that today? Lord, find everything that is hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. Some of you have come in here with a lot of anxious cares today. And then it says, see if there is any path of pain I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious everlasting ways. The path that brings me back to you. As I was preparing for this, I really felt like the Lord wanted us to search our hearts. We want, he wants us 
pray him to search our hearts. If there's any offense or unforgiveness or anywhere you may have been spiteful, or maybe you've just not had the right attitude, maybe you've just been sowing discord, I don't know, whatever it is, today God wants us to just lay it down at his feet and say, you know what, I'm not going to be focused on the outward, but I'm going to be focused on the inward. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in within me. And that's what God wants us to do today. Search our hearts, Lord. Find anything in there that's not pleasing to you so that we can just surrender our lives to you. If we're going to be in tune with God, we have to daily surrender our lives to Him. Surrender what our thoughts are, what our opinions are, whatever we think we should be doing, and surrender it all the way over to God today. Amen. Let's just stand to our feet. And I just want to invite those that are able to. We're going to sing this song. This is a song we sang during worship. And I just want, as an act of surrender, if you're able to come forward, I want us to stand up here and enter into worship today. And let this song be a prayer. That, Lord, we make room for you today. We're surrendering everything to you. Every wrong thought, every wrong attitude, uh, any offense or bitterness, we're surrendering it to you and asking you to come and be Lord of all of our life. Can we do that today? Let's sing this together.
Bunch of 